As we kick off our fourth module, we're dealing with layers four and five. That's the session layer. And for people who practice and um, are network professionals out in industry, layer five from the internet model, the internet protocol model is, is the final layer uh, that's used. There are common applications on the network that we use every day without a thought. So SMT stands for Simple Mail Transport Protocol. Anyone know what HTTP stands for? Has to do with hypertext, right? It's a transport protocol for hypertext. DNS, of course, is the domain name service. We'll be talking quite a bit about that. You've already heard about ARP and DHCP, but there's an interaction between these three that's absolutely critical. We'll touch on it here and explain that interaction, that critical interaction. But then in our final module for special topics, when we talk about um, creating network applications of your own, how important uh, there are the security considerations are for that interaction. So first thing we'll take a look at is this idea of a network socket. Has anyone ever heard of the term socket applied to a network setting? Has anyone ever heard like geek talk on a movie or something about, yeah, the socket isn't open or I think I have an open socket. It is a it is a common it is a common term, and uh, what we want to do is explain exactly what that is. So basically, does everybody remember port address translation? We were talking about conserving addresses. Yeah. So if the network portion, the network portion of an IP address tells you the neighborhood or zip code, and the host portion of the IP address tells you the building or house, you can think of sockets as doors or suites. Um, particularly in office buildings, you can have, you know, a huge number of floor numbers and suite numbers and room numbers. So a multi-story hotel would be a great example where the host address of the, the host portion of the IP address tells you what the street address of the hotel is. But then when it comes to certain resources or services or people, it's the door number. Think of socket, think of port numbers as door numbers. And there are two primary flavors of port number. We'll talk about that in a minute, TCP and UDP. And that's a kind of a generalization. But if you take an IP address and then you associate the port address with it, okay? So if you take a port, remote procedure call is a common network. This is how you can remotely manage machines across a network or, or network software can execute across a network on different systems. So RPC is a common application that has a specific port. The thing that I want you to understand is that when you have a server, you have a connected host or client, you have a connected host that's offering a resource. So anything that's offering a resource that's listening is considered to be a server. And that idea of a client server uh, relationship is, is a very important thing to understand, but you wanna get the basics um, clear. There, there's a lot of different 
information out on the internet. And the thing I want you to understand is that a server serves up resources, but any connected host can be, any connected host can be a server. For example, if I decide to share a directory on my connected system so that others can connect to it, I am providing a resource across the network. In that sense, even though my Windows 11 machine is considered to be a client because it's running a client operating system, in network terms, anything that provides a resource is classified as a server. Are there any questions about what we mean by server? The other thing to understand about a server is that depending on the resource, there are well-known or registered port numbers for a lot of common resources. We told you SMTP was simple mail transport protocol. And this email server if you have an email server that's providing email messages out of mailboxes, it's basically a glorified database server. That's a network application. And between the email servers, as it's transporting email from system to system, before it gets to the intended client for delivery, it uses port 25. It listens on port 25 for message deliveries. That's what a server does, it listens. So it opens a well-known established port, a registered port for its given application. In terms of a web server, it's port 80, port 80. So when you start a web server, it's running port 80. It's open, it's listening, and it's listening for requests, connection requests, and for subsequent transactions that follow, right? So the first thing it does is it's listening to see if anybody needs its resource. And then once the session starts, sometimes things are delivered without a session. We'll talk about that in a bit. With DNS, it's 53. Between DNS servers, when DNS information about host records is being transferred between DNS servers, it uses TCP port 53. But when we browse the internet on our web browser, we're using UDP port 53. Again, we'll elaborate on about that distinction a little more in just a minute. So a host is any device or system that's connected. A server is a special host that's listening for resources. And it's not about the size of the device or the system. So in your home network environment, you can have a device that's sharing its music. That would make the device a server, OK? Any questions so far? Now, when you take the internet address, the IP address, and then you add the port to the end with a colon, that combination, that forms a socket, okay? That's what's called a socket, a network socket. And if it's using port 80, the expectation by the entire industry worldwide is that because it's port 80, we know that's HTTP, we know that's a web server, right? So essentially, the web server forms or creates a socket and then opens that socket to listen. You can tell if you're looking at the log transactions between devices on a network, the system that starts up first forms a socket and starts listening on the network, that's a sure sign you're dealing with a server. Now, are there any questions about what we've covered at this point?
Does anyone have any observations? Or are you curious about a point given the material we've just presented? Now, the known ports end typically uh, within a thousand. So does everybody remember GRC shields up? We've done GRC shields up, yeah? Haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. And everybody remembers GRC shields up. You went to internet vulnerability profiling. Everybody still sees this, right? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. I wonder what's going on. Doesn't seem to be responding this morning for some reason. Oh. So oftentimes when you have a network misfire like this, it's a matter of DNS. And one of the things I can do is check my DNS to see if my DNS is set properly. So I can go here and look at information. Then I can go to DNS server assignment, right? I could switch to a local DNS. In fact, one of the things that we're going to advocate in our final topic as a special topic is that every home network, it's very inexpensive and very, uh, very important to be able to depend on the DNS service that your internet service provides. And if I don't have a proper DNS setup here, what I can do so I can list a local DNS server. Now you can set up a Raspberry Pi as a DNS server, right? I'm gonna put in 192.168.1.31. And what I have running here is a DNS server in a virtual machine. But I also have a Raspberry Pi. It's a $35 computer. And in my home network, I've set up something called the Raspberry Pi hole. And I can look at my DNS and I can open up the console to have a look at what it's doing. The important thing is to know where my DNS is. So now everybody can still see my screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So For some reason, my server is a little stubborn. I don't know if I'm having another video interaction with Zoom again. I've had problems with Zoom lately. Um, we'll come back to that in a minute, but this server is running on dot 31. That's the important thing to remember. So I can put this in here and then I can list an alternate DNS service like Google. I can save, and then I want to flush the DNS that I already have. When DNS tries to attempt to connect to something like I just did, and there's a negative response, that negative response is stored in the DNS memory or cache. If you resolve, your DNS problem, what you want to do is flush the DNS cache or buffer on the local system. And then if we attempt to connect again, see already I've got my screen up because I changed the DNS. Did everybody see what happened there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So on my server, my local virtual machine, I have control over what I can do on the internet, even if the internet service provider is down. But when I click on proceed, and then I'm getting ready to do the port scan, all service ports, 
there are common ports and there are service ports. We want all service ports. The service ports that GRC Shields Up examines is from zero to just over a thousand. And those are the common registered known server ports for registered applications. Some of them are profoundly important. For example, we've already mentioned email. We said that email is sitting on port 25. Does anybody here do web mail, web-based email? Okay, does anybody connect to Office 365 in the My Campus portal using their web browser to do email? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did you know that when you're using a web browser that web email goes through port 110? It's a little different. And there are some other ports associated with email, like this is secure email or Google Gmail, I think. And IMAP is another email service. It's a little better than pop email in terms of features. So you have SMTP on 25 and 587. But this alternate form of email service uses 143. This is very common, especially if you create your own email domain. Now on the client side, on the client side, the devices and systems that connect to the server connect with a random port of a very high number and it's just randomly selected. And so if you have a client that says, hey, I wanna to connect to a web server or an email server, when it starts to work that exchange and set up that transaction with a system that serves resources, a server, it's gonna use a random port a very high numbered port. And it's just gonna pick one between um, like 2,000 2, and, uh, or it could be 5,000 and uh, 65,000. You can get very high, high port numbers. That's how you can tell if something is not a server. Instead, it's what we call a client. A client is a host system or device that establishes a session, and there are two flavors of sessions, connected sessions, they have a connection that forms, or connection-less sessions between clients and servers. We'll get into that in a minute. And so when you're looking at GRC Shields Up, what you're seeing are the server ports on your system. In other words, if there's something malicious acting on your device and it's converted your device into a server without you knowing it your system starts to advertise on the network it starts to beacon if you will it's listening on a certain port right and that's not a good thing so if the firewall is open for a port but the port is closed it's blue but that means that service port Right here is port number 80, well, almost 80. Everybody see that? Yeah. Yeah, I see. Okay, now if I have a padlock on my web connection and I secure the connection with encryption and I use something called transport layer security or TLS, this used to be called secure socket layer, SSL. Secure socket layer was retired years ago. It was deprecated or retired. It's no longer used. It's replaced with TLS, still the same padlock. You use certificates to encrypt the connection and that uses 443. So if I hold my pointer over here, I can see, oh yeah, that's the secure HTTP protocol 
which used to be known as SSL. This website needs to update their junk a little bit so it shows TLS, right? But that's the port that's used whenever you have a secure system. If you're connecting to a web server that doesn't have it, what it means is that anything and everything you type into and out of that screen travels across the internet in clear text. Ouch. That's something we'll talk about in much greater detail in our final module in my special topics in the special topics session. In any case, here are some common, very well known ports. And I want you to know these by heart. Now, when I say email, I'm talking about SMTP, Simple Mail Transport Protocol. This is what the servers do with each other. And this is what the email clients do when they're connecting. When they're delivering mail to email clients, they use port 587. So that's kind of special. If we see email on port 587, we know, oh, that connection, that session has something to do with a client that's trying to get its email, right? And you use two sockets to create a session. So we have the server socket, right? And here's an example of a server socket. And once the session is formed, the two sockets, server side and client side, are used to create the session, okay? Very important. All right, Telnet, that's an old protocol. It's not used very often. It's unsecure, it's in clear text. But it's important to know that because sometimes if you do this, I have seen right here, everybody sees Telnet, right? Yeah. Did you know some of our internet service providers leave a port open so they can connect to your router so they can do things to help maintain it? The only problem with that is when they type in a password, it travels in the clear. So if you see blue here, it means your router needs some attention. And you should call up your internet service provider and in a polite manner, jack them up for being goofy because they're exposing you and everyone. Everybody got that? Yep. Okay. I've seen that in recent seasons on my island and on St. Thomas. I've seen this from our internet service providers. Okay. Now, LDAP. What the hell is LDAP? Everybody goes to the My Campus portal, right? Yeah. So everybody's connected with the Bucks Wi-Fi, yeah? And everybody uses a student ID number to connect to the Bucks Wi-Fi, yeah? Yep. Okay. So LDAP stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, right? LDAP. The reason that's important is because when you have a login for a centralized authentication process like student IDs or first initial and last name, something like that. When you're in an organization and you have a common login, that's tied to a user account. Those accounts belong to what's called a domain. We're gonna talk about domain environments in our final module in greater depth. But the thing I want you to understand is whenever you have a mid-sized to larger organization and they're using a domain, something called Active Directory, that means that there's centralized control. ITS can disable your 900 number. And LDAP is the service that's used when you connect and log in, it says, okay, uh, we, we have somebody trying to log in. So in simple terms, LDAP is used to support a domain environment that midsize and large organizations depend on. It's a very important protocol. The other thing I'd try to tell you, and this is really dreadfully important, 
LDAP should only be seen on a network inside a private network. You should never see LDAP in the wild any more than you should see Telnap in the wild because it means that you're exposed and your domain, the domain controllers, the key servers that do that authentication, they're exposed on the public network. That's a very bad situation. So that's an important safety tip there. We've already talked about the web. We've talked about secure web. Here's something. Kerberos is also used with LDAP. So those two kind of go hand in hand. Kerberos and LDAP, when you go to uvi.net, when you go to uvi.edu, you're using a domain. And if you're logged in on the local network with wireless, or at a workstation in a computer lab or in an office. Your faculty, they use their screens. They're connected to the local network. They're using this same port number. Well, we're going to get to the other flip side of this coin that has to do with firewalls, right? So we're going to talk more about firewalls, but we want you to know some of these basic numbers. File transport protocol was the first protocol that delivered content between systems on the internet. FTP, one of those ports is used to log in. The other one is used to transfer. You, you, get, you get files from an FTP server. And that's literally the command you use is to get. FTP were, was, is some of the oldest known protocol out on the public network. And it's still used a lot today but like Telnet, it's unsecured. There's a new version that's secured. It's called SFTP, right? Secure FTP. So it's operating on a different port, just like secure web is operating on a different port. If you're on 20 or 21, or you're on 80, you're in trouble. The only exception to that is Kerberos, okay? A lot of websites use an alternate port called 8080. And this is something that they do. Now, that's a higher number than 1,000, right? So when you're looking at from z port 0 to port 1055 right here, that's 1,056 known ports, OK? You can actually look up port numbers. and you may recall we used a tool called NetStat and NetSH. Does anyone remember NetStat and Net, NetSH? Yes. So you can get a port number and look it up, right? If you have a bunch of color in here besides green, you can click the text summary and it'll tell you the port numbers. That's a handy feature. All right. So... Here are some other ones that are well known, but I would call them scary ports. If these are out on the public network, it means that you have a database server that's operating, and that's not the best way to configure the network to access a database server. Again, we'll get into that in the final module when we get into network security. Has anyone does, ever heard of... Go ahead. Yes? Does the SQL stuff SQLite? It's, it's used for a server that runs large databases. Okay, okay. So whenever you have a large database server, one of the conventions that you'll find in computer science is that database and web are usually paired up together on a server on, on the back end of an application. And it's the web client and other software components that are operating on each of the connected clients. So you have a front end GUI and you have a back end database. So thank you for asking that. Has anyone ever heard of the onion ring or the dark web? Yeah. Okay. So the dark web operates on port 81 and port 82. 
These are, I would call them scary ports because hackers, when they see 1433 or 1434, they start to salivate because they know the system they're dealing with has lots of data and it's all very well organized into tables and data sets. And it's just a gold mine. If you see a system that has this, it means that an organization's database is probably sitting behind that screen and all of their data or much of their data could be accessible. That's why you don't wanna see that active out in the open if you can help it. Other ports that I would call common but scary are airline messaging ports, right? And airports. So if you see those ports active and the rest of the public is seeing them, that's probably not a good thing because you want airlines to be secure, right? You don't want hackers and terrorists to get a hold of that. Does anyone know what a UPS is? An uninterruptible power supply. Has anyone ever heard of a battery backup? Yeah, I have one at my house. Yeah. Did you know that they have a lot of those in a data center and they're connected across port 401? So if a hacker gets into that Kool-Aid, what can they do? Oh, shut off all the power. Shut off the battery backup. What's plugged, into, what's plugged into the battery backup? All the servers. Oh, the power's still on, but you shut down the battery backup. You powered it off. I would call that scary. Okay. You can change or set passwords across 464. So hackers look for traffic that has 464 in, it, in the mix because that usually means, okay, if I look close enough, I'll see passwords. This one in data centers, there's a special classification of disk sets or arrays on servers, very high speed, very large. It's what makes the data center go. We covered this in computer architecture. It's called RAID. Does anyone remember something called RAID, R-A-I-D? Yeah. Disk sets, right? Well, you can get a whole bunch of those together and make them very high performance and turn that disk set into a network disk. And all the servers don't have disks. The servers just have CPU and RAM and they connect across the network. If you have someone that's in the mix on your local network and they're seeing port 860, it means they could shut down the disks that are used for your server. So it's important to know the ports for the common applications, but then also understand how those resources are critical and where it's good to see them or not. So here we have a client server socket. We have a session. And the thing I want to remind you of, the lower numbers are, are known and always used by the system that is the server. Okay? And the common convention to indicate a session is to put both sockets and separate them by a comma. Okay? Usually inside a parentheses. So does everybody see that here? Yeah, I see. Okay. Now we're going to see this uh, graphic in, in another second on the screen. The other thing I'm going to tell you is that the blue color that we're going to show here in this next screen, when you see a port and the port is called an ephemeral port, that means it's only temporary. The port on a web server never changes. But when a client connects to the server, it's only taking a random port for as long as it needs it during that session. As soon as it disconnects from the session, the port is gone. The word ephemeral means, well, it's temporary. It's like a ghost. It's, it's very volatile. The word ephemeral means here, blink, gone, in the blink of an eye, right? So, yeah, I really don't, hold on. We got to see that diagram. Should be seeing that diagram. 
We're going to need to fix that PDF version of the, the thing. Hang on yet. Oh, snap. Okay, hold on. Let me adjust this. Where did you go? Where did you go? I hate it when this happens. There it is. All right. Everybody with me yet? Mm -hmm. Have you ever wondered how a server can work with so many different clients at the same time? Well, if you think about it, let's take this server. Let's say it's a web server. Everybody with me? It's 443. That means it has TLS. It has the padlock in the corner, right? And let's say it's on the network. And it's using a web address of 146.226.24.10. Everybody with me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now let's say that you and a fellow student are connecting to that server. And you're doing it from two different locations with the same internet service provider. When you connect to that server, it forms the session based on both of these socket details. So we have 146.226.24.10 colon 443 and what's the socket on this side volunteer please what's client a's socket uh 78.45.96.174 and then what colon colon four, 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 yeah. 61254 thank you so if we were writing out the session between the client, the first client and the server, that session identity would be different because the number is different. Everybody see that? The number is different. And if I come on the other side, look, the other student wants to connect to the same server. It picks a random number any one of 65,000 numbers. The odds are very, very good. It's not gonna pick the exact same number. It's gonna have a different port number, an ephemeral port number. It's a client and it wants to connect to a server that's listening. So it says, hey, I need some resources. What is the socket here on this side? Volunteer, please. Seven eight dot four four dot nine six dot one seven four colon five nine two five three. Excellent. Yes. So this session has the same server socket, but the client socket is different. That's how one server can keep so many different sessions with so many different clients apart. And remember that the client keeps that high number only as long as it's in the session. As soon as that client clears from that server, as soon as they clear off the UVI website or the Facebook or Google, the, the number changes, right? So that's what's going on. And these are the five important things to understand, right? So client requesting a device picks a higher ephemeral port. This is a unique and random number from the IANA approved list. These are the internet authorities. If you've ever wondered if there's a, such a thing as the internet police, that's the IANA. If you're a bad character on the internet, the IANA can yank you off the public network. Doesn't happen often, but yeah. The port attached is a socket. Two sockets make a session. The server uses a resource on a known registered port. 
port and IP address combination, the two together are a session. This is where we'll stop for our class today. Given the material presented, are there any questions? Can you think of any interesting questions? Um, for one of the uh weird ports that you could see in like the public, I think the last one when you said that um, it could, if a hacker gets hold of that, it could turn off the different disk in a server. Would yeah. it, would it um, it change like if it was like a SSD or. It wouldn't, that's a good question. Would it matter if the disk is different? Like if it's an SSD as opposed to a traditional hard disk, is that is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the hardware that's connected to the network, uh, it doesn't matter what type of hardware. So to answer your question, what matters is how it's connected to the network, which is why you create a separate, smaller segmented network when you have a SAN, when you're using iSCSI, you have a storage area network, you want to protect it. That's one reason why you would set up a separate network for servers. That's how you keep the bad guys out. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's it. It's a good question. Thank you for asking. Any others? Okay. Well, I will go ahead and... Um, close out our session. I will post a short assess assignment um, before we post the solution. For your solution, you're going to create DNS and you're going to, DNS should be in here. DNS is port 53. Um, I'm gonna edit this. You'll see a revision on the study guide. So instead of being module four study guide, it'll be module four study guide revision one, and I'll put SMTP here. And then we'll, we'll um, update that information there. All right, we'll see you on Friday. Thanks for joining and uh, have a good week.